This is going to be a brief tutorial uh, talking about the, uh, the contraction of cardiac muscle. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about actin and myosin, and I'm going to be talking about tropomyosin and troponin, and how all these things relate together. So, first stage. When we're understanding how contraction of a muscle works, if you're thinking of a big myocyte inside the myocyte or the heart cell muscle, heart muscle cell, um, inside the myocyte there are filaments that are sort of interdigitated, that's a word, like this, and when the muscle contracts these filaments slide over each other. So if this is the muscle you can see the muscle contracts by getting shorter. There's two types of bands that uh, slide over each other. The first is called myosin. It's the bigger band, and I'll symbolize that with my lower arm here. This is the myosin, and this is the actin. I'll roll up my sleeve here. Explain why in a second. But this is the actin, this is the myosin, and they slide over each other to contract the muscle. So these are the sort of muscle filaments that work. In order for them to slide over, there's an interesting bit of physiology that happens. The myosin themselves have little myosin heads that stick up, and it's the myosin heads that actually walk up the actin. And they do it in a way that's a little counterintuitive, because they use energy to contract, but not in the way that you'd expect. We'd usually think that what would be happening is the myosin head would grab onto the actin, and then uh, they do a bit of work, and they do a bit of work and come up again. It doesn't quite work that way. Um, the way to think about it is that the myosin heads naturally want to be contracted. This is their natural state. It's like they're made out of uh, rubber that's been set in this position. So in order for them to move, you have to introduce energy to extend them. That's the energy part. That's the thing that requires work, is for them to release and extend. The energy we get, of course, comes from adenosine triphosphate, ATP, which are like little batteries that float around with three charges. So every time you lose a charge, you're losing one of the P's, the inorganic phosphates. So you take an adenosine and you add three little phosphates onto it, three inorganic phosphates, and there's your battery all ready to go. When that battery, put it like that, like, how can I do that? Like this. So this is my adenosine. Here are my phosphates. This is a charged battery ready to go. So the adenosine triphosphate comes along, la di da di da and suddenly something needs work. So we rip off one of the phosphates. It goes floating away. Now you've got adenosine diphosphate, and poof, a little bit of energy. So the energy can work. And then it can go down to adenosine monophosphate, and then just adenosine, which is actually a drug that we give as paramedics goes on to the purine receptor. So here's my myosin, here's my actin, here are my myosin heads. They are naturally contracted up like this. In order to get uh, the big power stroke that we want, the actin and myosin moving like this, we first have to power the myosin heads. So a little ATP comes floating in, uses energy, and extends. That's the energy phase uh, for getting this to work. Once it extends and grabs onto another little receptor on the actin, it will just naturally recoil whoop, like that, and we get the power stroke happening. Then another ATP comes along and powers the extension of the myosin heads onto the actin, and then the natural elasticity of the myosin heads, whoop, up it goes again. So doop, 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 doop. it goes walking up, and that's how we get our power stroke. It's the extension of the myosin head that requires the ATP energy source and then the natural relaxation as it comes again. Without ATP, these just stay locked. They can't extend. And if you try to move the muscle, the muscle won't move because it's locked. It needs an energy source, which incidentally is what rigor mortis is all about. When people die, uh, after a few hours, their muscles become rigid in whatever position they're in and you can't move them. Why do the muscles become rigid? Because the actin and the myosin are connected. And in order for the muscles to be able to move, you need uh, the ATP in order to release the myosin heads from the actin. These things are locked 
unless you get your little ATP batteries coming along and allowing them to move, move forward, move back. Okay. So that's basically how it works. You've got myosin and you've got actin, uh, and you've got the myosin heads using adenosine triphosphate as an energy source to slide themselves up. Now I'm going to add a second layer onto this and make it a little bit more complicated because what in medicine is easy, right? Uh, the actin has a sleeve that can cover it up. And if the myosin heads are attached to the actin and this sleeve is extended or covering up the actin, the myosin heads can't get any traction and they can't move. So there can be no uh, muscle contraction. So this is how the body basically uh, stops the muscles from contracting. As long as this is there, they can't contract. So obviously this has to be able to be removed somehow, otherwise we'd always just be flaccid and we wouldn't be able to contract and we'd die because we wouldn't have any voluntary muscle movement, including breathing or uh, involuntary like our heart beating. So somehow this has to come off and this is how that works. There's a little button on this sleeve and that little button has three little, well, think of it this way. The little button itself is called troponin T. That's the button, troponin T. And it's called troponin T because it ties together two little uh, activity sites on the button. The one is called troponin C and the other is called troponin I. So, just to clarify the nomenclature here, on the troponin T button, there is a troponin C and a troponin I portion. The troponin C is called C because that's where calcium binds. So when our bodies, um, when our cells are depolarized, they get an electrical signal, they send that signal down through various mechanisms, transverse tubule, if you're familiar with that, and that hits the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the sarcoplasmic reticulum goes <sighs> and spits calcium all over this. The calcium binds to the troponin T button, specifically on the troponin C site, and goes and reveals the um, actin, and then the myosin heads can go, and that's fine. In order for this to deactivate, the troponin I part of the troponin T button, the troponin T is the thing that ties them together, so we hit the troponin C part, and now we're hitting the troponin I. The troponin I inactivates that removal of the sleeve, puts the sleeve back on, and now we can't move. So our muscles really need two things. This is our resting state. They need two things in order for the muscles to be able to contract. First of all, they need calcium going down here, hitting the troponin C and revealing the actin. And then the myosin heads need ATP as energy in order to allow them to extend and then subsequently passively recoil as they climb up the actin. After that, the uh, troponin I slides back down and covers up the actin. Now, interestingly enough, I don't know how the troponin I does that. Uh, the troponin I will inactivate the whole assembly, even in the presence of calcium. I don't feel so bad that I don't understand it, because at that end of the hall, I have a surgeon GP physician, and on that end of the hall, I have a uh, emergentologist physician, and right across from me is Tim, who's a PhD in physiology. <laughs> and as I was trying to understand this, I kind of hit the, my, my uh, you know, threshold of understanding with how the troponin I inactivates. And I thought, I don't get it. How does that work? So I went and asked them, and they all said, I don't know either. You've hit the limit of my knowledge. So you know what? For a paramedic, that's pretty good. It's good enough. If you understand the idea of troponin C, with the calcium reveals it, and troponin I covers it up, that's good enough. And the troponin T is the little button that holds the troponin I and the troponin, T, uh, troponin C, so the inactivation and the calcium. You'll, you've probably heard of troponin if you've been involved in emergency medicine at all because we test people's blood for troponin and depending on what center you're in you'll either uh, test troponin I or troponin T 
down in Adelaide in Australia here now, they're doing a study on high sensitivity troponin T measurements. But basically the reason we look into people's blood for troponin is because it's not supposed to be in your blood. It's supposed to be inside the cardiac cells, down in the muscle, uh, bound to the tropomyosin, which is covering the actin. It's supposed to stay here. If for whatever reason you've got troponin going around in your bloodstream, it means this thing has just gone <laughs> and exploded and the cell has lysed and the little troponin buttons have uh, been liberated from the myocytes, from the cardiac muscle cells, and are leaking out into the blood. So we come along as clinicians and we go, is there any, uh, is there any troponin in here? Oh yeah, there's troponin, holy smoke. There's a problem with that. The troponin shouldn't be in the blood. So if we see troponin in the blood, we begin to assume that there's a heart attack or acute myocardial infarction, a part of the tissue of the blood has infarcted, which means basically uh, died. And the death of that has allowed the cell to disintegrate and release these little troponin buttons with the C and the I on it out into the bloodstream where we detect it later and go, oh, that's not right, that's not supposed to be there. It's kind of like a car driving down the road and there's parts falling off. You can tell something must have happened in the car that destroyed it because the parts are falling off. So that is a, a quick tutorial on how the muscles contract inside the heart and also inside the voluntary muscle as well. But to recap, you've got the myosin with the myosin heads that like to be coiled. In order for the myosin heads to extend, we need to use some energy. That's the adenosine triphosphate energy. So adenosine triphosphate comes in, this extends. Adenosine triphosphate goes off as adenosine diphosphate. You lose some phosphate floating around inorganically. And then it comes, closes. Closes, 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 and climbs itself up along the actin, the actin head. This is called the power stroke. As it comes together, that's how our muscle contracts. However, it can only do that if the tropomyosin sleeve, which normally covers the actin, has been moved away. In order to move that away, we uh, get a whole bunch of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum coming on to the troponin T button and hitting the troponin C receptor for calcium, which moves it away, up it goes, and then relaxes again upon relaxation. Without, uh, without ATP, you can't have that movement, and that's rigor mortis. So to end this, the body then actually grabs onto the little troponin T button, specifically by what part? The troponin I, hopefully, is what you said, because that inactivates the whole process and covers it up.